All right, well, good morning again. Lots of stuff going on. And I um, want to welcome anybody who, uh, I don't think we have anybody on Zoom this morning, but that is one way that you can actually live stream during service, uh, our, our services. Uh, but we do post our messages on YouTube and Facebook uh, later in the day. And so those of you who are connecting online, I know we have quite a few that follow us. Uh, welcome. We hope that our messages bless you as well. And um, one of the ways that we worship Jesus is through our giving, our tithes and our offerings. And we can do that a couple different ways uh, in our in-person. When you're in service with us, there's a box on your way out of the main church doors. You can place your tithes and offerings there and you can give online. So those of you who are, who are really kind of connecting and following us online and you want to participate and support the ministry of Crossway Vineyard Church, you can do that at crosswayvineyard.org. There is a giving page. Uh, our giving, our tithes, and our offerings is just one of the ways that we acknowledge that all that we have and all that we are belongs to Jesus. And it's just one of the ways that we give thanks and we worship uh, Jesus. Um, so Holy Spirit, we... Thank you, God, for already the work that you've begun here this today, this morning, uh, the encouragement, the peace, the, uh, there's like a sense of togetherness. We're a smaller group in person here this morning, uh, but Lord, even those who are uh, watching this later during the week, God, we pray that you would fill them, that you would fill their home, fill their heart, and fill their life with the presence of your Holy Spirit. God, as we look at your word and we talk about community today, would you make your word alive in our hearts? Would you reveal the truth found in, the, in your word, in the Bible? Come, Holy Spirit. And we pray for uh, other churches in Urbana and Champaign County. God, would you bless them? Would you fill them? Would you encourage them? And would you empower them for the work of your ministry? That together we would see your kingdom advance and your kingdom shape culture. In Jesus' name, amen. I'm going to date myself a little bit here, uh, but I will say <clears throat> that these growing up, I would watch reruns of a, of a TV show. Uh, does anybody remember Gilligan's Island? <clears throat> remember that? Gilligan's Island, just sit right back and we'll tell the tale, the tale of a fateful trip. You guys know? Okay. Um, well, Gilligan's Island, you know, I, again, I used to watch the reruns growing up. It was about the skipper and Gilligan, if you remember that show. And there were crew members, and they took five passengers on a three-hour tour. You guys, are you singing the song in your head now? Okay. I hope that stays with you throughout the day. And what began as a three-hour tour ends up being a, a three-year sitcom, 98 episodes. And the premise of the, episode, of the sitcom was pretty simple. Uh, this group left Honolulu, and they were taking five people on this nice little excursion on the ocean, and the Pacific storm comes their way, and they run aground on an uncharted island. And for three years, they're trying to get off this island. And what we, during that TV show, what we see uh, in, the, in the episodes is how these, uh, this group of people coming from different walks of life, different spheres of influence, different socioeconomic levels. You had the Halls. Remember the Halls? They were like millionaires. And then you had, uh, you had Mary Ann, and she was sort of the, the tomboy. You, you, you remember that. Just a different group of people. And doing life together, sort of trapped on an island, you know, and, and in those, I mean, there were funny moments where, you know, they're just sort of getting on each other's nerves and they're learning to do life together on this island. And uh, while they're doing that, they're like stepping on each other's toes, they're offending one another, and then they're sharing soft times together where maybe they're reminiscing about their family, you know, um, in mainland. And, and, but what happens in, this, in, the, in, the, in the flow of the show, what happens is this group becomes a family, and they, and they grow in affection for one another. And they still drive each other crazy, but they grow this affection for one another. And they begin to believe for one another. 
and they begin to see the other person, the the um, you know the uh, the gifts and the ways, special ways, and what they bring to this little community on Gilligan's Island. I think, in some ways, Gilligan's Island is a lot like the church, right? We're all kind of on this island. You know, we're brought here by the presence and the and the the wooing and the drawing of Jesus Christ. And we're like coming from different places. We're learning to do life together. I've said over these last weeks, one of the things I love about the church and what concerns me with some of the trends that we see in the church. What I love about the church is that we're just a group of people who would not be in each other's life if it weren't for Jesus Christ. We wouldn't know each other. We wouldn't be doing life together if it wasn't for Jesus. Basically, apart from that, we tend to hang out with people who look like us, sound like us, eat like us, smell like us, vote like us. But the church is such a different organism, right? That we get to hang out with people who are very different than us. That's one of the things that I love about the body of Christ. And in that, In that, what we see happening on Gilligan's Island, let's spiritualize Gilligan's Island for a moment. In this TV show, this comedic look at a community, as they develop affection for one another, Gilligan and Skipper and Marianne and the Howells and the professor. I always liked the professor. He was like my favorite character. Like if there's anybody who's going to get them off the island, it was going to be the professor, right? He just seemed to be the level-headed one. But they find value in each other, and they find often what happens in the TV show, and frankly in life, and in the church, is that we learn to sacrifice for one another. That we begin to place each other above our own selves. That's what the, uh, uh, the Apostle Paul writes in Romans 12.10, when he tells the church in Rome to be devoted to one another in love, honoring one another above yourselves. It's a rich community when that is a truth that we really grab hold of and that we hang on to, right? My challenge for us and for anybody watching is connect with people who aren't like you, and it will enrich in your life. It will will challenge you. It'll drive you crazy sometimes, but it's an iron sharpening iron, right? We always tend to think like we're on the, uh, we're on the side that's going to sharpen everybody, right? We forget that we're, we're the ones that need some sharpening ourselves. We're the ones that need transformed. One of the ways that the Holy Spirit does that is through relationships with each other. This crazy thing called the church. <clears throat> So when we were in Minnesota, uh, you guys know, uh, you may not know those who are connecting online, Shannon and I spent five and a half years serving in a vineyard church in a town called Mankato, Minnesota. And it was in uh, about our second year there, uh, really community began to form that was just special. We grew as a community. We grew numerically, but maybe even Better than that, we grew uh, in our affections towards Jesus and our affections for one another. And sort of the result of of that, one of the results of that is uh, I had a a guy that I was really investing in, and he was sort of, I was raising him up to be like an associate pastor type, and he was like my right-hand man. We just, we did life together. He was part of our home group, our, our Bible study group we held, and he and his wife, and they ended up having a couple kids. And he was, he's a writer for CBS Sports, so I would get all the sports stuff directly from him. But he was also an author of books. And so one of the things that we talked about up in Minnesota, our staff, was like uh, community was percolating and developing. Like, And one of the things that God had put on our heart as a church at that time was that Cody, my my right-hand man, who was the writer, wrote a book. And it's a devotional that he wrote, and it's called High God, Simple Devotions for a Deeper Life with Christ. And what we did with this devotional, uh, we, we decided to get the community of the church involved. I wrote the foreword, and basically it's a, daily, it's a devotional where Cody uh, quotes a lot of pastors you probably know, and he includes me, I think he was being gratuitous, he included me in there a few times as well. And on the back cover of the book, the kids in our church provided artwork whether it be photography or drawings or paintings, the book, this book, this devotional represented community. 
And it was just like a wonderful product of what God was doing. Now, I've got a couple lectures this morning. So if you're looking for a devotional, um, first two hands uh, go up. We've got Tommy. Do I have one? And Jeff. Awesome. Guys, don't forget your devotionals before you go today. <clears throat> but it was just one of the pictures of community. And for me, as I dream for the future for Crossway Vineyard Church, I think about <clears throat> not necessarily devotionals, but what is Jesus going to form in this group? in this church, that will impact the world around us. That little devotional that was for the church, I mean, the church ate it up, they gave it as gifts, but other, other churches picked them up, the, and um, there was a bookstore, a coffee shop was carrying them. It, it made its way into a, um, uh, a halfway house for women struggling with alcoholism. Like, they were using this little devotional that we made uh, as sort of, because they could connect. It was easy for them to connect. And one of the ladies we learned that was really impacted by this devotional um, had a, went on a bender and, and, and had, uh, it wasn't just alcohol, it was, drug, it was narcotics and alcohol. And she ended up passing away of an overdose. But she was saved. Like, like she read this devotional, led her to the Bible, and some of the Christians in that group led her to know Jesus. So it's an amazing thing when a community comes together. We bless one another. We raise each other up to make a difference in our world. And we do it together, right? I love what Don's doing with the Bible Boot Camp. We're investing in young lives. Like there's something concrete being laid, foundational being laid in their life that God will build on, right? Question for you today, we're going to look at a couple scriptures as we talk about being rooted in community and we wrap up the series Rooted. When you look in the mirror, a friend of mine posed uh, this question some years ago. When you look in the mirror, do you just see yourself as an individual or do you see a community? See, I believe what the Holy Spirit does, now obviously when Wes looks in the mirror, he's not like we're all not in there with him. Hey, Wes, you know. Well, he's trying to shave. But when you look in the mirror, does your life represent just your own passions, your own circumstances, your own struggles, your own challenges? Or when you look in the mirror, does your life represent something greater and bigger than just you? Because I think it's the work of the Holy Spirit that when we look in a mirror, we don't just see ourselves. What we see in the Bible, we see community. We see others. I love the church. I have an appreciation for the many different denominations and expressions of faith in Jesus. Uh, today we're going to just kind of look at a couple different verses. We're going to uh, start in Genesis and then we're going to drop anchor in Proverbs. But I do love the church. As imperfect as we are and as often uh, as broken and imperfect as we are, we as a community Rely on the grace and the mercy of Jesus Christ. Amen. Right? I love that about it. Like, none of us in ourselves have it all together. Together we're made stronger. But it's not just, if it was just the together making it stronger, we'd be a bunch of broken people, like sharing just brokenness. It's being together and being unified in Jesus Christ that gives us strength. It's by being a group that is centered and focused on the presence of God and encouraging that in one another and challenging that in one another that makes us look more like Jesus as a community. The church of Jesus Christ was the great idea that Jesus put together, and we celebrate that. We celebrate that. What we're going to talk today a little bit uh, is the principle about how we, when we interact with one another, it's a, is a, is a word that the church has used for a long time. It's called fellowship. The Greek word would be koinonia. It's one of the principal words that means fellowship in the Bible. It's a word that appears 19 times in the Greek New Testament, koinonia, fellowship. In fact, you may not know the movement we're a part of, the vineyard movement. Uh, <clears throat> back in the old days, I go back a little ways. Every vineyard church was called Vineyard Christian Fellowship of whatever city you were in. Like, you, you couldn't deviate from that. So, like, Crossway Vineyard would not have, like, passed the sniff test years ago. Vineyard, and what they were doing, and it seemed a little bit strict to me, uh, you know, maybe less 
less creative, but I think early on what God was doing is he was planting something deep in our movement, the importance of relationships, the importance of community, the importance of fellowship, the importance of koinonia. But sometimes I think we overuse the word fellowship and we undervalue words like fellowship. You know, when we we think that we can sanctify any activity we do by adding the word fellowship to it. Have you been around church circles like that? We've got the weightlifters fellowship, right? We've got the left-handed basket weaving fellowship. So as long as we add the word fellowship and maybe some food at the end, it's a Christian activity. Right? Sometimes that's how we see the word is sort of has lost its meaning, I think, over the years. The, f- the word fellowship or koinonia. My hope is that today that we get beyond just churchy words and that we go deeper, that we see fellowship as living life together with the Holy Spirit and one another. Fellowship. In Genesis chapter 2, verses 18 through 20. If you have a Bible or device, we'll have it on the screen. We read, The Lord God said it's not good for the man to be alone. I will make a helper suitable for him. Now the Lord God had formed out of the ground all the wild animals and all the birds in the sky. He brought them to the man to see what he would name them. And whatever the man called each living creature, that was its name. So the man gave names to all the livestock, the birds in the sky, all the wild animals. But for Adam, no suitable helper was found. Not even a dog, like man's best friend, wasn't quite suitable. The principle is in the 18th verse, it is not good for man to be alone. Now notice the Hebrew construction of that verse accentuates the negativity so that the negative part is placed at the head of the verse. So it should literally be read, not good, not good is man alone. It's the first time that we see in the Bible, it's the first time notably that God ever said something was not good. If you know the story of Genesis, you know that God created different things on different days. And after each time, what did God say? It was good. It is good until now. It's not good for man to be alone. So to fix the problem, if we know the story, we know the narrative, God did something very good. And Adam, I think, would have agreed. And her name was Eve. Now, before I was married, I thought it was pretty good to be alone. Right Now, I had dated Shannon since we were 16, so it's not like, you know, I don't remember the days of not even having a girlfriend. We've been dating for, it'll be 33 years this year. You know, but I remember those moments of, like, thinking, it's pretty good to be alone, especially Sunday mornings. Sunday mornings, I was, you know, living at home. I was really into Cleveland Brown. So my Sunday morning, we didn't go to church as a family, so I'd wake up. And, and my father would have picked up a newspaper, so, and, and I would read the, the comics, the funny pages, <clears throat> you know, Dilbert. I would read all the funny pages, and I would sleep in, and then I would watch the Cleveland Browns lose. That was sort of my, my Sunday. But I loved it. Like, that was my thing. It was disconnecting. And, and I remember, like, I remember there were times, Shannon probably doesn't even remember this, when she'd get a little upset with me because she'd want to go do something. Let's go to a park today. I'm like, not till after the Browns lose. Like, I have rituals here, right? But I remember thinking, and we actually, do you remember? that? You, you do remember. We, we have not talked about this for 33 years. <laughs> like, uh, but I remember that, like, thinking, I need my alone time. It's good for me to be alone. Like, you know, I called the shots back in those days. You know, uh, I commanded my life. And I'm sure that Adam, you know, that for Adam, certain things were good about his life. The simplicity for Adam was good. He had a direct relationship with God, the Creator. Very few rules. He, he, had, you know, he had what most guys dream of, a perfect environment, no traffic to deal with, and the Garden of Eden, no taxes, no mortgage. And so life was pretty simple, and I would guess that Adam would have said life was pretty good. His responsibility load was pretty good. He, he had like the best job ever. You know what Adam got to do? He got to name the animals. Now, 
That's a pretty awesome job. So recently I read an article about the top five jobs in America as, as, as of 2023. And they were software developer, physician's assistant, financial manager, and information security analyst. Those were the top five. Did I say five or four there? Four. Okay, those are top four of the five of the top five jobs in America. Now, I would rank what Adam did as being one of the top jobs ever, like naming the animals. You know, and I suspect it sort of started, you know, like with these, like the word hippopotamus, right? When you break it down, there's scientific meaning for, for different aspects of that name. Now, I suspect it kind of started like that. Well, you know, the hippopotamus, like, you know, kind of scientific. And I think Adam was like running out of gas, running out, just getting tired at the end of the day. And he's like, dog, <laughs> cat, <laughs> like if he's anything like us. But that would have been quite the awesome job to be able to name the animals. And what, what does that mean? Like, you know, when God says it's not good for man to be alone, so he provides Eve. What does it mean? It means, among other things, that God created us or wired us for companionship. That there's another dimension to human beings other than just our physical selves, our physicality. There is spirituality. There's a social element to the makeup of our being. People require other people. It's how we're made. Dr. Leonard Kammer, who's a psychiatrist, uh, he was a psychiatrist for 30 years, specialized in treating, specifically treating depression, once said the human being is the only species that can't survive alone. The human being needs another human being. So community is the norm. It's the divine norm. It shouldn't be, shouldn't be an exception to the rule, and my sense for culture today is that it is. And I think what we went through over the last few years only exasperated that, isolated people, right? And it became very unhealthy, and it is still something that we face today, right? That we're still sort of swimming upstream, is recognizing, helping people to recognize their need for community, we don't grow spiritually like we would when we're around other Christians. We don't grow emotionally like we would when we're around other people. You know, we need each other. We need each other. We need a church. There was a season in my life very early on. I wasn't a pastor yet, but I was a leader in a church, and I was really struggling. And so Shannon would go to church. Um, we just had one child at that time. In my church, uh, literally every Sunday, I had a, I'm going to date myself again, I had a VHS tape of a Michael W. Smith concert kind of event, and that was my church, sitting alone in this dark bedroom, putting in the VHS tape. And, and I became very unhealthy. You know, I had become jaded and hurt uh, by God. I felt like by God and the church. I can remember when I did come back to church, it was recognizing, one, that it was the right thing to do. Two, I was becoming unhealthy. I knew I would end up becoming a husband and a father, not the kind of husband and father that God would call me to be, apart from a Christ-centered community, right? And when I remember my first time coming back to church, and that was like the hardest thing. You guys, if you've, if you've ever been away from a church and come back for a while, you're like, you're playing it in your head. Hey, who's the new guy? You know, you know, uh, who, you know, have you filled out a visitor card? You know, like all those things. I was just, that probably stunted me coming back to church for a while. But when I came back, I didn't hear any of that. I just heard love. They just picked me up where I left off. Good to see you, Dave. You know, and, and then I had a, a friend that was really close to me. And uh, it was an older couple. And she came that Sunday. She came to me. She said, you know, I'm not saying this to put something on you. Um, but you know you're meant to be a pastor. I didn't want to hear that, but I did. 
and was so true. Like, she, she had that permission to, like, if somebody else would have put that on me, it might have felt like a burden or a weight, like, oh, I'm failing. Like, it, didn't, it spoke life to me. It spoke truth. And it, it reiterated the trajectory that Jesus had for my life. As, as folks return to church, whether it be folks that maybe came to Crossway one time, or I suspect over this year we're going to meet folks coming in who maybe haven't been in church for a while, you know, can we make space for them to feel comfortable? Especially if they've maybe been a part of this church and they're coming back, you know, can we be generous towards them? And, and gra- I know that's your heart. That's your heart, isn't it? But, you know, before I was married, I thought I was the most wonderful person in the world, and I liked my alone times. (laughs) I did. When I was alone, uh, to me, I was nice. To me, I was kind. And because I didn't have to deal with a lot of people in close proximity, other than my girlfriend, I could afford to think that way. And then what happens? God brought a woman to the man, and that companionship caused me to realize I wasn't quite all that in a bag of chips. I wasn't all that I thought I, that I was. And it was tough, you know, interacting at first and getting along, spending a lot of time together, especially when we got married. Like, both Shannon and I lived at home, in our homes, like, until we got married. So that was our first time out of our house. And at first, everything was cute. We were, like, 20 years old. Like, everything was cute, right? Uh, my socks on the floor were just so cute. For a short period of time, <laughs> toothpaste in the sink, like, you know, hair after shaving, the things that guys don't really think about that much, uh, I found out women do. <laughs> things grew out of their cuteness together, and we became ironing, sharpening iron. We became sandpaper for one another, taking off the rough edges and the flaws. And that's the basic principle when, you know, when God said it's not good for, that man should be alone. One, because we mankind, men and women, we need companionship. Whether it be a close friend or a spouse, whatever that looks like for you, a dog ain't going to cut it all the time. We need close relationships. One, that we won't be as lonely. But also, secondly, we need people in our life that are going to shape something. People to tell us the truth. People to tell us the truth when we need to hear it, when it's hard. We need people like that in our life. We're going to follow up with a proverb, a, a proverb that speaks that truth is Proverbs 18, verses 1 through 2. We read, A man who isolates himself seeks his own desire. He rages against all wise judgment. A fool has no delight in understanding, but in expressing his own heart. A man who isolates himself seeks his own desires. Isn't that true? We Something is misshapen in us when we're apart from community. We come up with a lot of goofy ideas about who God is and who we are. And we don't like to hear wise judgment. A fool has no delight in understanding, but in expressing his own heart. Isn't that just so true? And then we can jump down to verse 24 of Proverbs 18, which is really the antidote to it all. Proverbs 18, 24 says, A man who has friends must himself be friendly, but there is a friend who sticks closer than a brother. That's God. That's Jesus. Here's the proverb, the first verse, a man who isolates himself rages against all wise judgment, that verse tells me, among other things, that there are events that occur to all of us in life. There are things that happen in our lives that cause us to tend to be isolated. That's the first reaction. We want to be alone. Isolation breeds more isolation. We want to be alone. We want to be isolated. We don't want people around. And if you're wondering, like, that's not a healthy posture of the heart. What are those events that cause us to want to be alone? Could be past hurts. Maybe being rejected. Painful relationships. 
Maybe you've been hurt in the past and you said, I am not going to let anyone come close to me like that again. We don't like know we're saying that, but in our heart somehow, maybe we built up a wall. Maybe it's dating. Like if, if you're a person and you're watching this, maybe you got hurt through a boyfriend or a girlfriend and you said, oh, I'm not going to pursue like a relationship like that again because I hurt so much. It hurt so much when I lost it. Maybe, maybe it's like a real deal. You know, this may seem trite to some, but it, it means something to Shannon and I. Last year, uh, we, had, we had a dog. for His name was Walter. I think he, we had him for seven or nine years or something. <clears throat> and, like, Walter got really accustomed. Well, I think Walter loved quarantining because we were with him all the time. And, like, we just became part of our family. He told us when to go to bed. He did. Like, if it was getting late, he'd, like, look over at us, like, it's about that time. Like, he really would. It's so funny. We would have company come over. And if, if it was getting a little bit late, he would literally walk them to our front door. <laughs> We're like, Walter, you got to be, like, don't be so mean to people. But Walter, like, uh, what I ended up doing, I used to, uh, this is going to, Growing up as a kid, my dad would eat Braunschweiger. I think I'm saying that right. You guys, does anybody here eat Braunschweiger or uh, uh, getting some quizzical looks? It's also called goose liver. Do you know what I Wow, you, not a world that you've not been exposed to, apparently. So Braunschweiger is sort of this really not good, very fatty, potted meat kind of a thing. And, um, but I would buy some Braunschweiger for, for Walter. I would get a little piece for me because I wouldn't eat a lot of it. But he knew the word Braunschweiger. And I'd say, Walty, you want to go, go get some Braunschweiger? And he would be like, yeah, like best thing in the world. So he would go with me. In the, we were just, and then we had to put him down. And then, again, this might seem like, come on, it was a dog, Dave. But he was like a part of our family. He moved with us to Minnesota from Ohio. You know, all those special moments. And it was one of the hardest things when we did have to put him down. To the point where Shannon and I still are like, we're never going to get a dog again. Never. Because we don't want to go through that pain again. Sometimes we're like that with relationships with people. Sometimes the pain that we experience and the disappointment with others causes us to say, I am not doing that again. I am not making myself vulnerable to another person. And we may not like consciously be saying this. But our actions will guard our own hearts. And I'm not saying that you just kind of are open to just anybody, right? Trust in relationship is developed. But sometimes we do that. We put up walls, high castle walls that protect ourselves. It also alienates us and isolates us from other people. And we find folks that are isolating themselves find themselves rattling around in their own minds, in their own peril. And sometimes, sometimes, people live out their entire life that way. Their whole life. Alienated, isolated, shapen, misshapen by hurt and pain. That's not what Jesus has for us, though, guys. As we build and develop community, it's not going to be easy. You're going to endure People that you just can't connect with, right? People you have nothing in common with. Like, uh, what's the old saying? Birds of, of a feather flock together or something like that. That's kind of how we are with, with relationships. But that's something about the Christian community is a little different. Do you know how many conversations in the last 32 years I've had when I couldn't care less what the person was telling me? It was about a world, maybe fixing cars. I am not a mechanic. I don't even know what's going on under my hood. I try to put gas and oil in it. That's all I know. And if the tire is looking low, my car tells me, so I put air in it. Right? Do you know how many conversations I've had about sports cars, muscle cars, gears, and I don't even know what they're talking about. I couldn't care less. But I care about the person. I care about the person. And I take joy in connecting with what other people care about 
even if I don't care about it. I learned that lesson as a father growing up. My son at one point was really into skateboarding. And he was surprised to know that when I was a kid, I skateboarded. My skateboard was different than his. But, like, I remember him telling me about skateboarding and about music that kind of connected to the whole skateboarding culture. And I remember thinking, man, I have no interest. Like, that music is loud. You know, you know you're getting old when you're saying, what are they saying? Like, I don't understand the words, right? Every generation says that about the previous generation. I don't understand. They're screaming. What, what are they so angry about? Like, I, and I remember, like, feeling that. But then I realized, you know, the way that my son was bringing me into his world, it was not about that he felt I needed to learn about screaming music or skateboards. He was trying to invite me into his world. And I cared enough about him to enter into the world with him, right? That's what community does. That's part of building one another. That's part of what the Apostle Paul, when he says, put others above yourself. That's part of what he's saying. And eventually we'll find deeper, richer relationships. We'll see what God is doing in other people's lives. Growing up in uh, Mentor, Ohio, which is about... Uh, 30 miles east of Cleveland. Well, that's where we raised our family, our kids. We had a home, and uh, it was sort of an older home, World War II home <clears throat> uh, neighborhood. And there was a lady that lived at the end of our road named Mrs. Walsh. Mrs. Walsh, uh, the whole neighborhood kids talked about. We moved in there, our kids, Josh and Leah, came to us, and they're like, Do you know that house? There's a witch, and if you get too close to her door, she'll catch you and eat you. We're like, come on, right, Mrs. Walsh. There were all these rumors. She was alone. Apparently, she ate her family. All these rumors that kids believed about. She was a scary house, right, and the, that the kids would, like, cross the street, not walk in front of, lest they be caught and put in an oven. Well, one, our first Easter in this neighborhood, we decided to bless our neighbors. We made chocolates, crosses, eggs. You know, we just made little Easter baskets for each, each neighbor. And we went house to house. And when we got to Mrs. Walsh's house, our kids were like, like we don't want to go up to that door, you know. But like, okay, we'll go with you. Because we would send our kids to the front door. We'd walk them down the sidewalk. And they, like, knocked on the rickety old door, Mrs. Walsh. It was sort of a house that was a bit dilapidated, needed a lot of work. And they knocked on that screen door that wasn't quite fixed well, all shaky. And this door creaked open. And there stood this little old lady hunched over. And, and our kids had their rehearsed line. Hey, we just want to give you this gift for Easter, just to let you know that Jesus loves you. And she was, she looked at him, and she said, I don't have any money. And she shut the door. <laughs> and our kids were like, well, we tried. I'm like, oh, let's try again. Knock, knock, knock. She opens the door. I told you I have no money. I have nothing to give you. And they said, we don't want any money, miss. You know, we, we didn't know her name yet. We don't want any money. We just want you to know that Jesus loves you. And would you like some chocolates for Easter? The ice, the walls came down. And she said, oh, I would love that. But let me hang on for a minute. And she went and got us these candies. I swear they were like 50 years old. You know, they were all clumped together. Like, you know, bless her heart. And she took the chocolates. Well, our kids developed a relationship with Mrs. Walsh. And they, she was from England. And that's where her family lived. She didn't have any family in the U.S., she was isolated. She was alone. She was lonely. She became vulnerable to the kids, and the kids that were all had the rumors about her began to love her, began to pick up her yard, mow her yard for her, pick up sticks. <laughs> Our kids learned something about people in that season of life, right? How God loves people, how God loves people, and the importance of being a part of a community. Our kids welcomed Mrs. Walsh into their world. Like, I don't know how close they became, but it was like the neighborhood kids became her adopted grandkids. Guys, we need by design, by experience, fellowship and interaction. 
But as I mentioned, it won't be clean. It's going to be messy sometimes. If you've been around church long enough, you know it gets messy if we're real with one another. If you don't want mess, messy relationships, just go to a church, attend the service, even go online, and have nothing to do with anybody else in the room. But you'll be lonely. You'll be lifeless. But you'll be without mess. Family is messy sometimes. It's not benign, it's not tame, and it's not always easy. It's dangerous. Because it means that you and I will have to risk actually lowering the walls that we've sometimes for years put in place. Not letting people in, not sharing our life with others, not allowing them to share their life with us. This won't happen immediately as our church grows, and we will. As new folks come in, it's not going to happen overnight, mostly. Mostly those kinds of relationships, really being vulnerable and transparent and growing a depth of relationship takes time. That's one of the reasons in the vineyard we really value home groups. That's really where stuff happens. Like Sunday mornings tend to be a place where it's easy to connect and it's easy to be a new person and not feel alienated. And then home groups is really where we do life. It's really where we learn uh, how, to, how to read the Bible, how to share the Bible. It's where we learn about growing in spiritual gifts. It's where we learn to pray for each other. It's where we learn about hearing God's voice. It's in the safety and the context of community within small groups. That's why we value small groups so much, home groups. Do you remember the first time you prayed for someone, like out loud? I remember it. Well, the first time in a home group, we were praying for a, la- uh, a lady in our church, and, our, and my pastor uh, created a home group just for us. We were like new in the church. We didn't know. You know, pastors are weird that way. But he, he made this home group just for us. And I remember I'm praying for this, this, this young lady who got hurt. She hurt her back at work. And, and I'm just learning to hear God's voice. And I remember thinking as we're all, she was in the hot seat, we're praying for her, and I'm watching and how hearing from God and how sharing that's being modeled. And I remember feeling that God was telling me something to share her, and I kept pushing it away. Oh, that can't be you, God. You you don't speak to me. And like as I wouldn't share it, my heart was like boop, 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 getting louder and louder, butterflies. I began to sweat. Either I had the flu or I had the word of God. I'm not sure. (laughs) And I remember, I'm like, I, I could be wrong, uh, you know, I, 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 this might sound crazy or weird, but I feel like, remember, I was just now walking with Jesus, first, you know, my life. I feel like God wants you to know, again, dismiss it if it's wrong, you know, but I feel like God wants you to know He loves you. Now, even if I was wrong. I was right, right? Like it's in the safety of relationships that we grow in hearing God's voice and that we affirm one another, that we grow spiritually. I'm looking forward to, I know we're going to be starting a home group. Um, we're not exactly sure timing, we're, but, and then we want to grow home groups in our church. But studies have shown, because I used to be a small group pastor in one of the churches up near Cleveland, and studies have shown that... Um, Generally, most people, it takes about a year in a home group with, you know, with the home group life that you're, you're creating for people to really develop a depth of relationship where there's trust. Generally about a year. Some people, two, three years. Some people, like, within a month, they're already, like, sharing their deep, right? But they're more than anonymally. It generally takes about a year of connecting with, a, with, this, with people and developing trust. And there's nothing magical about the number. There's nothing magical about a year or two years or a month or six months. The idea, the principle behind that is that it takes walking in life with a group of people. Like doing life together. Like not just on Sunday, but all of us like celebrating marriages, celebrating the birth of kids or grandkids, grieving with one another when we lose somebody that we love. It takes doing life together, the ups and the downs, and dealing with the messes in life to really develop a deep relationship with others and trust with others. That's what home groups represent. 
in the vineyard. And we're looking forward to, to that. I know, um, I think COVID kind of messed a lot of that up for a lot, for a while for folks, but, uh, we're looking forward to that. We're looking forward to sort of bringing that back on and developing more home groups and home. And you know what it is? It's a place where preachers are born. It's the place where worship leaders first cut their teeth in leading a group in worship, right? I mean, skill-wise, but also just learning how the Holy Spirit is leading you as a worship leader. That typically will happen in a home group environment, in the safety of relationship with others. It's a beautiful picture of community. I'm going to close with this story. So if uh, Troy and you guys, if you want to join, um, this will be fairly brief, and then we'll end with a worship song. <clears throat> but um, <clears throat> I had been reading about uh, geese. Uh, geese and I have a love-hate relationship. Like, I love being out in the wild when they're kind of flying in their, in their formation, and you hear them coming from a distance. Wah, wah, wah. It's kind of beautiful. They're not so beautiful when you're dodging what they've dropped in, in the yard or in a park or wherever, right? It's a love-hate relationship. But one of the things that I love, and I do notice every around fall or even early winter, is the geese that fly from north to south. And if you've ever noticed, I think I've got a picture, they fly in a V formation. And again, you can hear them coming. Wah, wah, wah from a distance. And they fly in this pretty impressive, wonderful V formation. I've always thought it'd be, wouldn't that be like the coolest thing to propose through geese? Like have them spell out, will you marry me? <laughs> Just a thought. <laughs> and the way it works is that, I don't know if you know this or not, but that V formation, the way it works is that the goose in front is actually providing lift for the ones behind it. And the V formation enables geese to fly because they're flying with much less resistance because they have a goose in front of them or geese in front of them, it enables them to fly 71% further than if they were trying to do the journey alone. They can go that much further in a group than on their own, 71% further. And, and if when they're flapping their wings and they're flying formation, if one gets out of formation or gets too far away from the, the crowd, he notices immediately because of the resistance the air drag, so he'll get back into formation in order to take advantage of that lift. Now, the lead goose, when he gets tired, or just sort of what he'll do is he'll actually get out of formation and go to the end of the line and take a little breather because, you know, the, one in four, and the, the lead goose is getting all the resistance, and they take turns doing that. They share the load. They share the load. And that honking that you hear from a distance, the wah, wah, those are the ones in the back who are encouraging the ones in the front to keep it up, to keep pace, to keep flight, to keep the time, so to speak. They're like, wah, wah, come on, guys, keep it going. We're doing. I don't know how scientists know that. I don't, I don't know what goose translator, but <laughs> behavior analysts have, not, have, have noted this. They're encouraging the others to keep going, wah, keep it going. Something else I learned about the formation of these geese, if one falls because it's hurt or it's injured or it's sick, two will accompany it. Two will accompany and stay with that injured goose either until it dies, so this would be like where they, they land, until it dies or it gets better and they end up rejoining the rest of the group. Two geese intentionally stay behind. Guys, we're going to achieve who Jesus wants Crossway to Vineyard to be in our community and in our world. We're going to achieve it together, right? We're going to want, want each other when we need want. Does that seem right? <laughs> We're going to encourage each other when we need encouraged. We're going to sit with each other when we need to rest. We're going to be a part of speaking truth and life into each other's aches and pains. We're going to celebrate the things we celebrate, and we're going to grieve the things that we lose. But we're going to do it together. And in doing that, we as a church will look more like Jesus Christ to the world around us. Amen? Amen.
Lord, we thank you for your truth, God, that you've called us to be a community. I thank you. Just even for folks who have been a part of this church for years and years, like have laid a foundation that these truths aren't new. They've seen the building. They've seen it. And we get to continue to build on that. Holy Spirit, that the, the community that you're bringing together and that you're assembling, the, the formation that you're calling Crossway Vineyard to be, God, it's going to look like you. It's going to sound like you. It's going to smell like you. It's going to bless like you. God, help us to live a life that when we look in a mirror, we just don't see ourselves but we see a community. In Jesus' name, let's worship Him.